of heaven. Uh, some people talk about, teach here also that this is pointing to a rapture, but that we could have a problem if we think that sequentially in the book of Revelation, here is rapture, and everything that is discussed after here is after the, the rapture. Um, so I think that's, that's what we're going to see in Revelation 4 again and 5 is the result of the church age uh, that Revelation 1 through 3 was addressing, encouragement to the church throughout the whole church age. And now, uh, in, in part of uh, this kind of this great encouragement to us is to see the result of the church age. So John comes, comes up to heaven, come up here, and of course, we look forward to the time where he does say to us, come up here. Isn't that great? And he says, I will show you things which must take place after this. And so what he's going to show him, or what John is going to see in Revelation, he's going to interact with angels, and angels are going to help him understand things, and he's going to see things, and he's going to say, um, it, it's as this. And, and as he's describing especially heavenly things, he, he doesn't try to literally describe every detail of what is in heaven, but he gives the symbols. And especially about God, he doesn't uh, describe exactly what he looks like. Um, and then uh, verse 4, it says, Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And as if you'll remember, we talked about the fact that we see these are then redeemed. Um, they are those who have overcome, and so they've been rewarded with their crowns of gold on their heads. And on Sundays, as we've been talking about uh, gold, that is tried and tested by fire, so our faith is also refined and purified and tested by fire. So we see these are uh, these elders are representative of the redeemed. They're, they're leaders in the body of Christ. They're elders, but they're representative of uh, the redeemed, the saved, the church. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices, Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. That number 24 is the number of representation uh, from the Old Testament. The law of Moses, there were 24 orders of the priesthood, and so they were representing, the priesthood represented all of Israel, in fact. So reverse 6, I wanted to revisit this. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like uh, uh, like crystal. What John saw, he, he compared, he said it's as a sea. It's like a sea, uh, like crystal. And so this is a symbol here. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were the four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. And so I wanted to focus in on this sea a little bit. And so as we study through the Bible and as we see uh, the symbols that are used throughout the Bible, uh, oftentimes in the Bible there will be something will happen at the Sea of Galilee or the Red Sea. And when we have a name of a sea or a geographical place, then it's talking about that literal sea. But in the Bible, when we see a sea without a name, without a geography, it represents a mass of people. And in the book of Revelation, even when we see the beast come out of the sea, it's talking about that what comes out of the masses of people on, on the earth. But what John is seeing here in, is in heaven. And so he's seeing a mass of people in heaven. And so this is the result. This is, uh, so the people, the, Christ, the church is here. And this is, we're seeing the reward uh, even of the church. Uh, even as we continued through chapter 4, we see the elders casting their crowns uh, down at uh, Jesus in, in chapter 4 and 5. So a sea of glass, clear as crystal, and, uh, and it's a, a sea of glass speaks to also the peacefulness of it, it's still, was before the throne, and it reflected all the brilliant colors of the entire heavenly scene. So this is a, a brilliant, it's clear, it, there's, there's no blemish, there's no flaw in this crystal. And so we have to pause for a moment to think of on the earth natural crystal 
Um, crystal is one of the few things um, you can, you can in, in uh, gold or bronze or silver, you can hide uh, defects, diamonds, but in uh, crystal you can't. And so this is uh, reflecting all the brilliant colors of the entire heavenly scene. Uh, and so again, it's not said that the sea of glass was a literal sea, but that it looked like one. But uh, let's go look at a couple passages. We didn't do this before. Uh, I just told you what it represented, but I want to show you a couple of scriptures. Isaiah 57:20 says, "But the wicked are like the troubled sea." So that's not a sea of glass. It's got waves and wind. The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. And so that's talking about activity of humanity on the earth that's casting up uh, bad things even and evil things and uh, wars and murder and theft. And, and so often the sea is a place of evil. In fact, the, the evil beast comes up out of the sea, these things that are being cast up out of the sea. So this is the imagery, even in the creation in the beginning, in Genesis, the sea is, is seen as this chaotic, wild place that the Holy Spirit is hovering over when God speaks and the Holy Spirit brings order out of chaos. So the sea was always seen as a, the thing that da was dangerous and that evil things came out of. And so let's go forward to, in Revelation to chapter 17 in verse 15. And at the beginning of 17, uh, John saw the harlot sitting upon many waters. And in verse 15, we get an explanation. He says, uh, in verse 15, Then he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So here we have even the Bible uh, giving us definition here that many waters, a sea, uh, is uh, representative of people, multitudes, and so a mass of people, uh, nations even, and uh, all kinds of different tongues, in fact. And so one uh, commentator said this, uh, thus torrents can think of the sea here in Revelation 4 as the sea of humanity in perfect harmony with God around his throne reflecting the light with no defect, with no flaw, glorious, in harmony, harmony with God, without the ripple of trouble upon its many waters. So here in heaven, we have a, a, a great mass of people as many waters, but there's no ripple of evil here. Isn't that cool? In uh, Exodus 24.10, the elders saw under the feet of gold and the theophany a paved work of sapphire stone. So there's something uh, going back to the Old Testament of, of seeing uh, the floor where the throne was. But I want to uh, bring us now back to the New Testament epistles and look at something because the sea of the redeemed, and, and we saw that the elders, the, uh, the 24 elders are also there, also there around the throne, and they're even representative of all the people in the sea. And they're clothed with, with white robes and golden crowns. And so it's not just 24 people and they're the only ones that got crowns. There's lots of people in the sea who have crowns and are also uh, wearing white robes. But look at what Paul the Apostle says about what Jesus uh, does in his church that, that here in Revelation 4 that we see. That, or that John saw, and John's telling us about it. So in Ephesians 5, 25, he says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So we have this sea, a mass of people. We see the bride of Christ. We see this mass of people who are a glorious church. And so here in heaven, we see the glorious church there around the throne. 
that she should be holy and without blemish. Now, I want to take you to another place where one of the other apostles talks about, he identifies what blemishes are. So 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter tells us this, then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. And remember, that's kind of the context of the beginning here of Revelation, of writing messages to the church who are uh, being tempted, who are being persecuted, uh, being martyred. And so definitely what God wants to say to us is that God knows how to deliver us out of all those kind of situations. So the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment. And that's a major theme of the book of Revelation also, redemption and judgment for the day of judgment. And so notice we have this theme here that Peter's talking about, about the day of judgment. And this is what John is going to see as the the book, the scroll with the seven seals is opened. We're going to see judgments happening. And uh, the salvation of God's people. Verse 10, and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority, they are presumptuous, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. Uh, We have a subheading here. Of course, that's not the scripture, but it's kind of giving us... uh, a pre, preview announcement of what's going to be continued to be said, but depravity of false teachers. So these are people that, that posture themselves to be even spiritual people. Uh, they're teaching things, but they're teaching wrong things. They're false teachers. But these, like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes. So in the sea of glass-like crystal that's clear, no blemishes, no flaws, that is reflecting the glory of the light of the rainbow, uh, uh, of the God's glory in heaven, there's no spot or blemishes in the church. carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you. So uh, that's very interesting that the Bible gives us even a, a definition of blemishes and spots. Those who might have been throughout church history, even in the church, but, but were not uh, were not cleansed from uh, the the things he just described. So let's go uh, ahead to Revelation chapter 5 and verse 1. Just trying to reset the scene here for for chapter 4 and 5, that John's in heaven. uh, And and when when John goes up to heaven, he goes from from the perspective of the earth, which is a, a perspective set in time. God is above time. And so when John leaves the earth to go to heaven, he's now seeing in a perspective beyond time. And uh, so here from heaven's perspective, we can see more times on the earth in a chapter. Does that make sense? And so, but it's very tempting when we read this to think, okay, where is this in terms of the sequence of what's happening on the earth, and it doesn't necessarily exactly correlate in this kind of thinking. So Revelation 5, verse 1, And I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth, or under the earth, was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. 
Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Now, I want you to notice something. This elder says this to John. And we're, we're kind of reading through this chapter right now. We're going to come back and comment some, on some things. But I want you to notice something, even as we're reading it. Um, the elder said to me, do not weep. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. Who is this? Jesus. And this is what John hears. He's, he's weeping and he hears, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. What does behold mean? Look, right? Behold. The line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And so now, verse 6, John responds to behold. It says, and I looked. And behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a... What did he hear? No, he, he saw a lamb. Now let's back, see, I want you to notice this. <laughs> yes, he heard, behold, look, and you'll see a lion. But when he looks, he doesn't see a lion. He sees a lamb. Very interesting, right? Now, in our kind of, in, 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 uh, in our understanding, we, we very often now, so we associate Jesus with the lion and the lamb, and that's true, he's both. But I just wanted to point out that he heard, oh, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he looked, and what he saw was the lamb. And so that's very much on purpose. We're seeing something here. When he heard the lion of the tribe, he would be expecting to see a lion. But he saw a lamb. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. That's interesting, too. There, Here's a paradox. I see a lamb that looks like it's been slain, but it's standing there. It's alive. <laughs> and so sometimes even when you see pictures of this, you'll, you'll see like a slashed, you know, bloody lamb. Uh, so when he sees the lamb as though it had been slain, I mean, how would that look? If you saw uh, any kind of creature as though it had been slain, right, it definitely, yeah. Sir, it wouldn't be standing, but this one is standing. And so we see here uh, an allusion to the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. Having seven horns, seven horns speaks to his, his awesome power and authority and that he's a ruler which is what he heard, the lion of the tribe of Judah, which is a ruler, and, and having seven eyes. Now, the seven eyes uh, represent the Spirit of God. And so that's very interesting. Now, earlier in chapter 4, we saw the seven lamps. We saw the Holy Spirit symbolized here at the throne in heaven, but now we see the lamb with seven eyes. We see Jesus with seven eyes representative of the Holy Spirit. And so we see the unity and the closeness of how much the Holy Spirit is with Jesus. Now, the seven eyes also represent omniscience, great knowledge. So the seven horns represent great power, and the seven eyes represent great knowledge, okay? Okay which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So John tells us specifically that these seven eyes represent the, the spirit of God, um, but it's in the symbol of Jesus. Uh, the Trinity is one, right? Yet distinct. Verse 7, Then he came and took the scroll, the, the lamb did, came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense. Uh, the golden bowls full of incense uh, are full of the prayers of the saints, which are the prayers of the saints, which, of course, he tells us what they are. And they sang a new song, saying, you are worthy to take the scroll. That, that's a great song, because John was weeping bitterly that no one was found who could open but here is one that can. So they're singing a song of praise to the Lamb that he is worthy. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. So now they're saying, 
uh, for would, would mean because. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, tribe and t- fam- tribe is, is, is family groups and, and tongue is, you know, every language and, and, and people and nation, every kind of way you could classify people on the planet, all of them, uh, there are redeemed out of every, every place, right? So notice here that, that this is Jesus, and he's qualified through what he's done in redemption on the cross. Now, they're praising him um, that he was slain and, and that he's resurrected. Now, that doesn't happen in the future like after the rapture. This is pointing back to what Jesus did when he first came. But it's, it's, uh, they're praising him about like he's just accomplished this, okay? And have made us, so he's redeemed us out of every family, every nation, every language, every tribe, and made us kings and priests to our God in this, his kingdom. And we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. And we're talking billions here. And uh, some have, have said, um, you know, right now as the church is on the earth, there are angels. How many of you know there are guardian angels? There are angels all over around this earth accomplishing God's will, Remember, Jacob saw angels ascending and descending on the ladder, right? And some have said that it seems in this scene that all the angels are there in heaven. And saying with a loud voice, so the angels are joining in, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And this seems to be referring to what he's even just taken from the hand of the one who sat on the throne in the book or the scroll. So they said before, uh, verse 9, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And then now they're saying, worthy is the lamb, in verse 12, who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Verse 13, and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power. Be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. So the scene in chapter 4 continues uninterrupted into chapter 5. And we see in chapter 5, 1, the one sitting on the throne, the recipient of the praise, is now portrayed again with the additional feature that he is holding a book in his hand, okay? So in chapter 5, the focus moves from God enthroned in heaven and surrounded by adoring and worshiping elders and living creatures to the Lamb who is alone worthy to open the scroll of destiny. The worship of God for his role in creation gives way to the worship of the Lamb for his work of redemption, which is also another way of saying for his work in the new creation. The recreation. Restoring all things to the perfection that God had originally made things. So I want to read from a commentary here about this scroll. There has been much speculation as to the nature of the scroll and the hand of God. Of the suggestions that have been advanced, two are especially noteworthy. One, that it is a double inscribed contract deed. You know, we've talked about before, like a deed to the the earth. The other, a testament or will. And isn't it interesting uh, that a will comes into action when the testator dies? 
So in the lamb's case, he died. And then he's alive. So, and he's overcome death, which is part of what qualifies him, and that's what they were singing. The former goes back to ancient time when contracts were written on tablets wrapped round with clay on the outside of which the nature of the contract was briefly stated. When papyrus or parchment was introduced, fundamentally the same procedure was used and the document was sealed with seven seals. I mean, so in the ancient Roman Empire, there were these documents and they were sealed with seven seals. Now, that's not the only reason that we have this number of seven seals here, though. A related procedure took place with the writing of a will in that a will was sealed by seven witnesses. And after the death of the testator, it was opened. So the lamb couldn't open this book until the death of the testator, but now he's the one opening it. He was dead, now he's alive. When possible, in their presence. So this, this book is opened in the presence of uh, God and the lamb. In reality, the two notions are closely related in that a contract is an everyday form of covenant and a testament is a special kind of covenant. On that understanding, the scroll in the hand of God represents his covenant promise of judgment and kingdom for humanity. And so it's representing then also this future eternal kingdom of the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's representative. He represents all of us in his church. He's made us kings and priests in this kingdom. Amen? So Ezekiel chapter 2 also refers to this book. And there's reference here in Daniel 12 and Isaiah 29, which we're going to go look at. So let's look at Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 9. So Ezekiel looked and he saw, there was a hand stretched out to me and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. Then he spread it before me, and there was writing on the inside and on the outside. And written on it were lamentations and mourning and woe. So that's interesting because in Revelation, as Jesus begins to open these seals, and if you notice as we're reading through Revelation, uh, he's going to open a seal, and then things are going to happen. Something's going to happen. We're going to see something. Then he'll open another seal, and then another, another th event will happen. We're going to see something as he opens each seal. And one of the, some of the things that we're going to see as he's opened some of these seals is we're going to see woes. In fact, there's going to be an angel saying, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4 says this, but you, Daniel, shut up the words. So Daniel was shown some things about the future, about the end times. But in Daniel's time, uh, he was told, shut up the words and seal the book. Until the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. And so that right there is even a prophecy about what uh, will be happening at the end. Knowledge shall have increased at the end. Well, guess what? We live in a time where uh, we live, we've lived in the information age, right? We have access to more knowledge than any other uh, generation has. I mean... Today, you can go, if, if you go to school, you have access, kids that go to high school have access to, to more information than the school library, you know, than when we went to, we had one textbook when we went to school in a class, you know, and, and if we were going to find the answers to our homework, it was going to be in that textbook. Right. <laughs> How narrow. <laughs> but, to, but today, students in high school could could go anywhere in the world through the internet and find information that might help them in their, in their homework. So look at this. Uh, Many shall run to and fro. Also, at, we live in a day when you can get anywhere in the world pretty quickly. And so are, do we live now in a day when people are running to and fro? Yes. What a prophecy that when Daniel said this, they couldn't have even imagined how much we would run to and fro and how quickly we could get places today. 
So this is a, a, a prophecy even like on the outside of this prophecy telling us when the time of the end would, would, what it would look like. Verse 9 of Daniel chapter 12, And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. So we see that here with Daniel was a book about the end, and it was sealed not to be opened until the end. And in Revelation 5, we see a scene at the end of Jesus uh, as the Lamb opening a book with seals about uh, the end. Amen? So, but one of the things we need to notice about Jesus as he's opening the seals of the book and what qualifies him is what he's accomplished in redemption. So that's a major, that's telling us a big clue right there that, that, that this book has something to do with what Jesus has accomplished through his redemptive work. It tells us what he has accomplished in redemption through dying and rising from the dead as a human because this, this book also was, was sealed and written for a human to open. So there's no angel qualified. An angel wasn't human. And so the lamb is human. Jesus, how was, how was Jesus crucified as a human? You with me? And uh, it's because of the incarnation that Jesus became human, which is a marvelous miracle then in itself. And so really, in one sense, until Jesus was incarnated, he wouldn't have been qualified to open it. Well, because... Um, what they said that qualified him to open it. And, and depending on, if, if we understand what it is, so we're going to look at a few more things to help us understand that here in just a moment. Let's read this uh, verse in Isaiah chapter 29, verse 11. The whole vision has, be has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one who is literate, saying, read this, please. And he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. So here, these prophets are talking about books that have been sealed that uh, only a, an authorized person can open and read and see it. In the, in the, the Jewish commentary on Ezekiel 2.10 that we read about that book, uh, what it said was that the scroll contained what had been from the beginning and what is going to be in the end. So all those verses we just read, Ezekiel, Daniel, Isaiah, all of those Old Testament backgrounds enhances further the notion of judge, judgment with which this vision is saturated. All the, those uh, backgrounds of where we find those those prophets are prophesying about judgment. So the context or the background even that we have in, in Revelation 5 is a background of judgment. So the background in Ezekiel in chapter 2, a, a book of lamentations with words written on both sides is handed to the prophet. Again, the idea of a heavenly book containing the future course of history is reflected in such passages as Psalm 139, verse 16 all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. And so in Jewish apocalyptic uh, literature, we read of heavenly tablets that contain all the deeds of men that will be upon the earth to the remotest generations. Going now back again to Roman law, certain documents were required to be sealed by seven witnesses. And although the idea of seven seals is used here is undoubtedly governed by the symbolic use of the number seven in Revelation and signifies the absolute inviability. In other words, uh, this, is, this is sealed and secured uh, completely and perfectly. You know, don't think of like a natural scroll with, with the wax seals. Could somebody break those? The number seven means it's perfectly sealed, okay? 
In Daniel 8.26, the prophet is told, seal up the vision for it concerns the distant future. In Isaiah 29.11, when the time is fully come, the seals will be removed and history will move swiftly to its consummation. And so when the book's contents are revealed in the following chapters in the book of Revelation, they have to do not merely with events surrounding the elect or the redemption, uh, salvation of God's people, but also and especially with judgments on unbelievers or the wicked. The books in Daniel 7, Daniel 12, Ezekiel 2 have to do principally with events of judgment, which are then followed by the salvation of God's people. So the emphasis of the book in Revelation 5 is also apparent from the fact that the parallel little book in chapter 10 mainly contains events of judgment. Uh, John will be asked to eat that book which are followed by a narration of events of salvation. And so a book containing God's plan of judgment and redemption, the book could be understood as containing God's plan of judgment and redemption, which has been set in motion by Christ's death and resurrection, but has yet to be completed. The question asked by the angelic spokesman concerns who in the created order has the sovereign authority over this plan. And again, if it, we've talked about the scroll also having uh, some characteristics of being a title deed to the earth. And so uh, who has sovereign authority over this plan for the earth, all right? So whoever has the authority, whoever qualifies to open it has to be one who would have the sovereign authority over this plan for the earth, Okay that the book represents authority in executing the divine plan of judgment and redemption is clear from the parallelism of the hymns in chapter 5, verses 9 through 10, and chapter 5, verse 12 that we, that we read. The, the hymns to the Lamb, okay? The former interprets Christ's worthiness to receive the book as indicating his authority to redeem his people and establish them as kings and priests. Now, notice also that his authority not only in himself to open the book, but his authority to establish us, his people, from the earth as kings and priests, okay? The latter hymn, the second hymn, interprets the Lamb's re reception of the book mentioned in verses 9 through 10 more generally as his reception of power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And so the book is a testament, the, the above interpretation of, uh, of chapter 5, verses 9 and 10 by the hymn of 512 also indicates that the book is a testament that names an inheritance to be received. And so a covenantal promise of inheritance should be understood as a covenantal promise of an inheritance when seen in the light of the above two identifications of the book in chapter 5 in those two hymns and of the broader theological context of the apocalypse concerning paradise lost and regained. So let's back up a little bit. In the beginning, God promised to Adam that he would reign over the earth. God gave the title deed to the earth to Adam, the first man. Although Adam forfeited the promise, Christ, which the New Testament calls the last Adam, was to inherit it. So originally, Adam was to inherit it, okay? And so it was given, it was promised to a human. A human person had to open the book because the promise was made to humanity. So this goes to the question, why wasn't anyone on the earth or even in heaven found who qualified to open the book? Because we'd all sinned, okay? No person was found worthy to open it because all are sinners and stand under the judgments contained in in the book, okay? So let's go look at this in Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, 
Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth. God gave the earth to humanity, to mankind. And, and specifically, there was only one man, you know, when he first... So Adam was given a dominion or a kingdom. Adam was a king, king of the earth. And if he had not sinned, you know, he would have had children who had children and children. He would be king of a society on the earth. He goes on to say, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Fill the earth and uh, subdue it. In other words, rule over it. Cultivate it. By the way, uh, as, as uh, Jordy was sharing the other day at the election, uh, when Adam and Eve were created, God put them somewhere. Where did he put them? And, and they, they were created from the, the dirt. And where, where were they put? What was their first environment? A garden. Now, what's, what's different about a garden from a forest? You can eat things. In, yeah, we can eat things in the forest too if you know what you're eating. <laughs> but a garden is ordered. It's cultivated. Things are growing according to a plan, and things are trimmed and pruned and, and harvested, right? So Adam was to guard, bring, bring about God's order all over this whole earth. God was to order the earth. I'm sorry, Adam was to order the earth. Well, Adam, he messed up, <laughs> And mankind ever since. And, and so we, th to a certain extent, the, the earth has, has become very organized, but yet it misses the mark, doesn't it? We have civilization, but it's not ideal. We have decay, yes. We have decay and death and, and corruption in civilization. So again, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Notice that every environment on the planet, mankind was giving, given dominion over, over the air, over the sea, and the land. That's the planet. Let's look at uh, Psalm chapter 8, verse 3. The psalmist says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? And that, uh, this word visit here, we have a, a, an expansion here to give attention or to care for. Verse five, for you have made him a little lower than uh, the angels, but here again is this letter B telling us what this word uh, is, is, and this word is Elohim, which is the word for God. And Jewish tradition uh, uses this word also for angels, which is why it's translated angels. But really, you've made him, man, a little lower than God. And how did Genesis say that man was made? In the image and the likeness of God. And you have crowned him with glory and honor. Now verse 6, you have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. It's the work of God's hands, but God gave the dominion for it to Adam. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, that pass through the paths of the seas. All right, now let's turn over to look at Psalm 115, verse 16. And here again, he says, The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's. But the earth he has given to the children of men. And so, 
as we look at these hymns that are sung in heaven in chapter 5, Christ was found worthy because he suffered the final judgment as an innocent sacrificial victim on behalf of his people, because thou were slain, whom he represented and consequently redeemed. No doubt he was also considered worthy because he overcame the final judgment imposed on him by redeeming a people and by being raised from the death. And so uh, if it's also included in, in, in uh, as far as having dominion on the earth, and that is included in what is given to Jesus, um, that had been originally given to humanity. And so Jesus is receiving promises from God that he first originally ga gave to Adam. And so Jesus is a son of man, and so he qualifies to receive promises from God to man. And so Christ was able to inherit the promises of the book as do all those who are represented by him. Now, at the same time, in order for us to be included in, uh, in his kingdom, to be made by him kings and priests, we had to have a relationship. So he became a man to, to represent us. So here's the thing. When Jesus is opening the seals, when he takes the book and he can open it and look at it, he's doing that as our representative, Okay? And so uh, as he does all those things, as, as, as uh, we're represented by him, shows that we also participate in his kingdom and in his priesthood. Just as an interesting note here also about some of the description of this scroll, this is not the first time uh, we looked at the, the book in Ezekiel that had writing on, on the both sides, but there's an, a very earlier one too. That's in Exodus 32, 15. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand. The tablets were written on both sides. We don't often think of that when we think of the Ten Commandments, because in all of our representations of them, we only have writing on one side. On the one side and on the other, they were written. So interesting. So let's think about uh, these seals, uh, especially in the context of um, earth history, the Roman Empire, uh, an artifact seal. Seals have been used throughout history as indicators of authority, identity, and approval. The earliest known seals date from the 4th millennium B.C. They uh, often took the form of necklaces or rings and were closely guarded. The seals were impressed upon wet clay or hot wax. And the images on each seal were unique to their owners and served to identify property. They were to safeguard against fraudulent transactions and ratify official documents and rulings. And so there is testamentary evidence that seals, which uh, could also represent witnesses uh, on a legal document, would give the contents of the document in abbreviated fashion in the seal even, or, or writing on the outside of the scroll. So sometimes the right, and, and, and so it's just natural scrolls uh, that were sealed, that were official documents, there would be writing on the outside that would be a summary of more, con more detailed contents on the inside. Right, sure, yeah. You could, and you could read the back of a book and it would give you a synopsis too, right? So that, that went on even in ancient scrolls where there's gonna be more detailed content when you open it up and read it, but even on the uh, outside of it, on the other side of it, would be a brief summary or, or brief description of some of the contents inside. Which we can kind of imagine even as we see, you know, when he opens the first seal, there's just get like a small paragraph of what, uh, what he sees from that. But there's going to be more detailed uh, happenings associated with it. So 
but maybe that the seal is giving us a brief description of the contents of the scroll, not that we're reading necessarily the whole scroll. Does that make sense? So, uh, therefore, the unloosing of each seal could indicate the revelation of a detailed part of what was written in the document. Although Revelation is full of sevens, it may be significant that Roman wills were normally sealed with seven seals. Seals on legal documents guaranteed that no one had opened or tampered with them, and a will could not be opened until the death of the person whose will it was uh, could be attested. If a will was in view here, it is significant that it is the lamb who has been slain who is worthy to open it. At any rate, under Roman law, a document was valid only when the addressee had received it, and it is thus ready to take effect. And so for Jesus to have died and, and been risen from the dead, and then he comes and he receives it, it's ready to take effect. And it's been shown to be possible that in the construction of some scrolls, this is in history, and we refer to this before, but part of the role could be revealed with the breaking of each seal, which seems to be what we see happening uh, with uh, Revelation. The symbolic presentation showed a scroll or a rolled up parchment with seven seals affixed to the side in such a way that if unrolled, the seven seals would need to be broken one by one as you're unrolling it. So sometimes we see pictures of it with all seven across like the outer uh, edge and you would open all of them and then open the scroll. But it, it, uh, there were in history scrolls that had them uh, placed that you would open it as you're unrolling the scroll. And so that scribes would start to write a part and then they would seal it. And then would, they would roll it up and seal it, continue to write, roll it up and seal it seven times. Either understanding of, uh, of what, how the seal actually is would mean that, though, that parts of the book's contents would be progressively re revealed with the breaking of each seal and would not have to wait the breaking of all seals because as he breaks one seal, there's information that's revealed as we read the book of Revelation. He doesn't break all seven seals and then we start to get uh, Revelation. Does that make sense? As each seal is broken, another part of the book is revealed, of the book of Revelation. So one of the elders alerted John. Again, let's, let's think again about this lamb and lion. One of the elders alerted John that the conquering lion of Judah was present, yet when John looked, he saw a lamb that had been killed. And so the lamb was a, this lamb described with the seven horns and the seven eyes again was a creature of power, great power, and great knowledge. Certainly this scene in heaven was meant to evoke worship and praise for Christ, and it also reveals how Christ differs from expectations of him. Based on what the elder said, John would be expecting to see a lion. Um, and there were prophecies of Jesus in his first coming. There were prophecies that the Jews expected to see something, but they saw something they didn't expect. There was the question that the Jews had, is, is the Messiah going to be Messiah ben David, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, a ruling, conquering king, or is he going to be Messiah ben Yosef, the suffering servant? Some Jews expected a conquering hero in the Messiah, and still to this day, many Jews don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah because he, he, uh, he died on the cross. He, he did not rescue Israel from Rome. He wasn't the conquering hero for Israel that they expected. And so others saw a powerless Jesus, and so they will be surprised when he reigns in power. So the Lion and the Lamb definitely uh, are referring to Christ, with the Lamb referring to his first coming and his death, and the Lion referring to his second, judge, uh, second coming and his sovereign judgment of the world. So it, it's what Jesus did as the Lamb in his first coming that empowers him to do what he does as the lion at his second coming, okay? So what he did as the lamb in his first coming is very important for what he does as the lion at his second coming. Now, this is the only place in the book of Revelation where Christ is called a lion, whereas the word lamb is found 27 times in Revelation, 
But we do see even in this picture of the lamb with the seven horns, we see uh, authority and strength of a ruler. The fact that he has conquered is speaking to the fact that Christ's death and resurrection were decisive victories in the war against evil. Christ's conquering activities gave him the right to rule. Okay? Not just that he's going to return and, and judge everything, but, but what he did in his first coming is fundamental, is foundational to his right to rule. And so now to open the book for this lamb is also to overcome death for man, which is why John is weeping when no one can open it. So the Messiah, Jesus Christ, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Christ proved himself worthy by living a perfect life of obedience to God as a man, dying on the cross to pay the penalty for the sins of the world and rising from the dead to demonstrate his power and authority over evil and death. Only Christ conquered sin, death, hell, and Satan himself. So only he can set in motion the forces that will bring about the final destruction of all evil. So he's also qualifying to open this because of his complete victory over all those things. In the song in chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, again, praise is attributed to Christ because he's worthy to open the seals. Worthy as the lamb, he's worthy because of his redemptive work which he did as, a, as, a, as the God-man. And this redemptive work is described by four qualitative terms. Number one, it is for God primarily, thou didst purchase unto God. Okay? You did purchase unto God. You did something for God. This same idea is reflected in Ephesians 1, 1 through 14. The redemption of man is, first of all, for God's benefit for his pleasure, for his glory. Number two, it is through Christ's blood, thou wast slain, thou didst purchase with thy blood. This can have reference only to the sacrificial death of Christ on the cross. Number three, it is unlimited. Men of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. The grace of God through Christ is not limited to any nation. It is for all nations. Number four, it makes the redeemed, a kingdom themselves and made us them to be unto our God a kingdom and priests and they reign upon the earth. And so as people partake of the redemptive work of Christ, they become parts of God's kingdom. They become priests to serve him here in this world. For such redemptive work, the elders praise the Lamb. And a multitude of angels join in to sing of the worthiness of this lamb. Natural creation also joins in to sing blessings and honor and glory and power and dominion. And so again, what we see here is the, the, the new creation praising its creator. Well, let's go back real quick and uh, read the end here of chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. So we'll be wrapping up here. So it's in verse 13. So different... Uh, it's mentioning different characters uh, singing these hymns. In verse 11, then I looked again and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and of the living beings and the elders and they sang in a mighty chorus. Worthy. So in other words, sometimes we just kind of go past these songs as, okay, this is a worship song, given praise, okay, great. But there's actually very important details in these songs. Uh, Revelation 5.11, 
Then I looked again, and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and of the living beings. Those are those four creatures, the, the, the lion, the, the man, the eagle, and the ox. And they sang in a mighty, mighty chorus, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then afterwards, there's going to be another song, but now we have additional character singing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth, every creature, and under the earth and in the sea. So every creature, and so in the video that we saw a couple weeks ago, and actually that's on, uh, we put on the Facebook page today, that kind of is just a brief visual synopsis of four and five. Uh, it shows all of creation praising God. So that's what we're talking about here at the end of this chapter. This, this last song is being sung by all of creation. Right. Well, so in the epistles, the apostle says that every tongue shall confess. <laughs> right? And, and again, there he says, whether under the earth or in heaven, yeah, so every person everywhere. <laughs> What's that? Right. Well, eventually, yes, they are going to be brought up to be judged at the great white throne judgment. They, they will confess, yes. They will uh, give glory to God. Not, um, excuse me? Sure. So the Bible says that every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess of every human that's ever lived. Yes, yes. So, but here in this, no, not because they're changing, their, not because their destiny has changed, but they will acknowledge that who he is. They, they know, when, when people have gone to, they know now the truth. <laughs> but so this passage, and then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea. Not, but, but so he's describing not only people, but all of creation, every creature, the birds, the whales. Okay? Now, uh, so in the new creation, will those animals be talking? Perhaps. But, but the, the birds singing today are, are, in one sense, glorifying their creator who created them to do that. In their own tongue, yes. Animals have their own language, right? And the four living beings said amen, and the 24 elders fell down and worshiped the lamb. So natural creation joins in to sing. Uh, they're glorifying uh, yeah, Jesus, yeah, Jesus said even the rocks would cry out. So John's first vision closed with the thrilling scene of the triumphant saints and an adoring universe offering praise and homage to the triumphant Christ. That's how we end at chapter 5. Now in uh, chapter 6, the Lamb's going to open the first seal. And in chapter 6, he's, we're going to start to look at uh, as he opens the seals. But this scene of, Re of Revelation chapter 4 and 5, this scene was designed to, to bring new courage and new hope to the hearts of John's first readers and of us today. The persecuted Christians of Asia, it brings the same cheer to Christian hearts in any age because we see the final, we see the final result. We see the final victory. Christ the lion is victorious because of what Christ the lamb has already done. The lamb was standing in the center of the throne near God and was the object of adoration by all those present, including the four living creatures and the elders and all the, the church there. 
The gold bowls filled with incense are described as the prayers of God's people. These prayers from the believers on earth and throughout the church age. By the way, uh, prayers by, by the apostles, I mean, they're still before the throne. Those prayers are never you know, gone. Uh, they have prayers for God to bring his justice to the earth, as the later chapters in the book of Revelation will describe. Let's look at this Psalm 141 uh, for a moment. Psalm 141, prayer for safekeeping from wickedness. Uh, a Psalm of David, he says, Lord, I cry out to you, make haste to me. Give ear to my voice when I cry out to you. Let my prayer be set before you as incense. So throughout the Bible, we see incense as a symbol of prayer, a representation of prayer, because incense is a sweet-smelling savor. Our prayers are a sweet-smelling aroma to God who receives them. The lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. And so the administration of God's righteous justice from the throne of heaven, we see that God is sitting on the throne at the conclusion of, uh, or, or of the future of the end time, and that that will mean deliverance for God's faithful people and justice and judgment on those who have rejected God and persecuted his people. And we see again here in Revelation 5 that the Lord has purchased men for God. They're his joy. He rejoices in them from all nations, all tongues, every tribe, every people, every color, right? Red hair, blonde hair, brunette, gray. <laughs> And so the figure is that of setting people free at a price to be redeemed, to be ransomed. In the ancient world, slaves were sometimes set free uh, through generous people paying the cost. And uh, in the modern world, hostages have been similarly liberated uh, by a ransom. The pattern in view here is that of the liberation of Israel in Egypt to become the free people of God in the land of promise. And here in Revelation, we see the greater emancipation for life eternal in the kingdom of God has been accomplished for all humankind at the cost of the Redeemer's blood. Hence, the redeemed become a kingdom and priests to serve our God, so fulfilling the vocation to which the ancient people of God were called. Their reign on the earth will be their service. So we'll finish right there.